Hello, everybody. Welcome to Dreams Unzipped, where we uncover the beauty of dreams to reveal the truth and the beauty of who you are. This is Kelly Sullivan Walden, aka Dr. Dream. And today I am joined by someone I admire so much. I dream about her. I love her. I um, am so thrilled and honored to be working with her on my on the Two Chicken Soup for the Soul books, one that came out a couple years ago, Dreams and Premonitions, and one that's soon to be coming out. Here's a pre preview of it, Dreams and the Unexplainable. But today, Amy Newmark and I are going to talk about a brand new book that is being released today as we speak, and a very new kind of book and a new direction for Chicken Soup for the Soul. And Lola has been wanting to, to say hello to Amy. So, hello, Amy. Hi, Lola. <laughs> this is my kind of, in parenthesis, America. My kind America, in other words. So, Amy Newmark, you've published so many Chicken Soup for the Soul books. You have your own book that is um, simply happy. That's your story of how... of how reading thousands and thousands of chicken soup for the soul stories and submissions. There it is. There Simply it is. happy. My magnum opus, my life's work. Yeah. Yeah. So impressive. Um, but, but today we're going to talk about my kind of America, not your kind of America, my kind of America. Just kidding. This book, um, let's, let's just hear from you. What inspired you to come out with this book since you're not typically a politically oriented brand, but yet here you are. This is kind of political. Yeah, it's only political if being in favor of diversity in America is political and it didn't used to be political. And mm. if Publishers Weekly ran a story about our My Kind of America book talking about how Nobody would have considered this political before, but this book is in favor of religious diversity, cultural diversity, lifestyle diversity, all the different ways that the United States has always embraced the diversity of its people. And that's been really a cornerstone of why America was created. I mean, our earliest, our earliest settlers were here for religious diversity reasons. Um, you know, while, I, while you were talking about the Dreams book, I all of a sudden realized something. And I was going to tell What's you that? about this. I'm now going to do it during this interview. So I had this dream about a week ago. And, you know, I never remember my dreams because I'm not like you. I don't remember them. <laughs> but this dream had such an impact on me that I tried to remember it so that I could tell you about it. So in this dream, there was this turtle. And it was a big <laughs> turtle, like you know, like at least like 12 or 15 or 18 inches across. And it was, a, it was a seat. It was a cross between a sea turtle and some other kind of turtle. But anyway, it was one of those big turtles that lives for, you know, decades. And I was like shepherding this turtle through this awful thing it had to go through where it was going through these water chutes where it would go across on the chute and then go down kind of like Splash Mountain, but for turtles. <laughs> But, but really, really bad. But for some reason, the turtle had to go through this. And I was standing there by the chutes, filled with this great love for this turtle, feeling, oh, I'm so sorry you have to go through this, but you have to go through this. And being there and kind of reassuring the turtle as it went through this mini Splash Mountain experience over and over again. And I just realized that dream must have been about Hurricane Harvey. And I'm so... I'm so bad at dream analysis. Like, of course, that's what it was about. And it was because we had just created this book and I was mm. watching all the kindness going on in Houston that just makes the point that this book makes. And I just realized the turtle was like all of these people living through the flooding and me feeling like we're there for you, you know, and feeling this great love for everybody. So I guess I turned the people of South Texas and Louisiana into this lovable turtle. Oh my goodness. Okay. I know, I know, you and your dreams, right? Do you mind if I throw out a, a thought or two? Oh, now you can this dream? as long as it's not embarrassing. <laughs> no, I don't think it will be. I think it's, it's actually really beautiful. I'm trying to remember, I remember hearing about Turtle Island and isn't that what the Aborigines refer to as the US, as, as the world? Um, I'm not yeah. sure that that's true, but it's... You're right. No, they, I think there was that. 
Yeah, so there's something about the ancient quality of the earth, of the turtle, and you being this, it makes me want to cry, actually. It's like um, reassuring the earth, not just this turtle, but what it represents. If it were my dream, I would think that I'm kind of being sort of a midwife, a shepherd that's, that's helping it during this transition. And it's going to be okay. It's been around forever. It's going to make it through. This is just, this is just an intense time. I think that's it because I think I had this dream right before I went on TV in Chicago last week to talk about great interview, by the way. Oh, thanks. I I went on to talk about shared it all over Facebook. It was great. It was perfect. It made me cry again. This, this whole, this book makes me constantly cry. It was on ABC in Chicago and I only got two and a half minutes because they needed to do hurricane Harvey coverage, but we, we made the point, which was that this book is, reassuring everybody that the America that we love is still there. And the New York Times had a headline just an hour ago about how Hurricane Harvey is showing that, you know, the fiercest storm ever has shown the best behavior ever because people are helping each other in Texas, regardless of who they voted for, what they look like, their, what they're, demographics are, their income level, their religion, their lifestyle, anything else. Everybody's reaching out and helping everybody else. And now we're going to see that happening in the Caribbean also. And then I guess, unfortunately, in Florida. (sighs) Yeah. And you know, what's really something is that I ran um, a podcast. Oh, it was today. Today (laughs) This whole podcast, I interviewed Laura Sue Walensky, who has a story in this book, and it's about South Florida during Mm. Hurricane Wilma. So unbelievably relevant. And I, of course, I didn't know that. I recorded the podcast a couple of weeks ago and had no idea that this was going to be coming, um, this this Hurricane Irma. But Laura Sue's story is so great because she talks about how after 9-11, she realized she didn't know a single Muslim. And she's Jewish. She lives in South Florida. She joined a group down there that's a joint. It's a group that uh, puts together Jews and Muslims, and then they do things together in the community. And they Mm. get to know each other as people. And she related such a great story about Hurricane Wilma. So there was a high rise apartment building in South Florida that was filled mostly with Jewish retirees. And a mosque wanted to build a building right next door to them. And the Jewish residents opposed the mosque, but it was built anyway. And then Hurricane Wilma came along and this building lost power for a week. The residents of that mosque took it upon themselves to carry food and water up the stairs in this high rise apartment building for a week to all of those elderly Jewish residents who had opposed them. And they became such great friends. And then when the mosque wanted to expand and build a new building um, nearby, they ended up, the Jewish residents ended up going and speaking on behalf of the mosque at the county board meeting. Wow. So isn't that great? And that was from Hurricane Wilma. It was a great example of what happens and how Americans rise to the challenge and how crises bring out the best in us, no matter where we thought we stood prior to the crises occurring. One thing that I I love about, about this book and and it's like where we, what we put our focus on tends to grow. And in reading the stories, I would start to have my own memories of exceptional moments of kindness. And it's just, it's like a switch, switching the radio station. It's like the news would tell you that the world is going to hell in a handbasket or it's already gone to hell in a handbasket and it's the worst of times. And, but yet we read these stories and many of these stories are very recent, not all of them recent, but many of them are are pretty recent. And it makes you think, no, there's a, there's so many great things happening. It's just, in the news, it's the nature of it. What bleeds leads. And these stories are about healing the bleeding. And so they don't make the big news, except I'm so happy that the chicken soup for the soul community, which is huge, millions of people, they're, they're going to be reading this. It's going to give them so much hope. 
Yeah, I, and if you look at the news, it's there's just a really a tiny minority of people who are being jerks. Tiny. And everybody else is nice. We're a nice country. And there was another story that had a big impact on me. It was by Cynthia Gary. And she is African American and her mom grew up in the segregated South in the 1950s. And her mom was a little girl and she was getting on a bus with her mother, oh, who was Cynthia's grandmother. And the little girl sat in one of the front seats of the bus. And her mother was saying, come on, we got to go to the back. And the white lady who was sitting in that seat that the little girl sat next to said, no, 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 you can stay here. And all the passengers around said, it's fine, it's fine, stay here. And that story has been part of Cynthia Gary's family history for decades. And they tell that story over and over again. They tell it to each new person born into the family because it's their way of remembering that even at a time that we now think of as, you know, we see that kind of segregation in history and we think of it as being broad and, you know, mm -hmm. it was institutionalized. And so we think of it as something that, oh, everybody in the South acted that way. But right. They, and, and that's the point. And Cynthia then told me on uh, last week's Chicken Soup for the Soul podcast that the other story that she didn't tell in the book was that her mom, as a little girl, also went and used a whites only water fountain. And again, mm -hmm. all the people around, the white people around said, no, it's fine. It's fine. And it just shows that even when there are bad things that are legislated, it doesn't mean that the American people approved of them. And right. I thought that that was very reassuring because as a northerner, I'm, I live in Connecticut, I grew up in New York. You know, I just had this view of, oh, everybody in the South believed that, but they didn't. And Cynthia told that story in our book. And that made me open my eyes to the fact that what we believe about history is not really true, just as we see a tremendous outpouring of support for immigrants today. And right. for all the other people who a very tiny minority view as undesirable, history might say, oh, America ruled against immigrants. But in fact, the vast majority of people love immigrants, love the energy that they bring to our country, the hope, the hard work that they, that they perform here. Um, so I thought it was, it was enlightening for me as well. I didn't know what I would learn while I was creating the book. I'm so glad that you put this together. I'm so proud of you and I'm proud of the Chicken Soup brand and I'm proud to be connected to it because I feel like it's, you know, there's, it's like there's the idea that, that goodness, happiness, that could be namby-pamby, butterflies, rainbows, unicorns, that's not real, that's fluffy. But the way that Chicken Soup the stories are always told in a way that is so grounded because it's, it's like it's, there, there's some kind of pathos. There's some kind of pain that seems to show up in every story. And then there's this elixir. There's this medicine that comes around that says, no, love is bigger than the fear. And, and it's, it's so, it's, it is chicken soup. It is medicinal. It is healing. Um, Oh, I love gosh. the fact that you said it's not fluffy because you know how there are people who somehow think, oh yeah, chicken soup for the soul. That's what you give grandma on Mother's Day. And yes, we are totally in favor of that, but we are not fluffy. I mean, these are hard hitting real stories, many of which have historical significance. This is important stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the stories that I just read that, that um, I'm in the middle of the night crying my eyes out, um, it's the story by Julia Pfeiffer, America Carried Me, and it's after the, all of the, the nightclub was bombed. Oh, the Pulse nightclub. In the yeah. Pulse nightclub, and how she talks about being, being gay and how um, she, it's like almost like the news in her mind or, or before, if gay people were, were killed or tortured or hurt, it would almost be made a joke of. And yeah. And so she, when this bombing happened, she was so devastated. And then when she dared to turn on the news, she was shocked to see the overwhelming outrage at this one hateful person that, that did this bombing and how many people were wearing rainbows and, and were, were, were in support and solidarity and how much that was healing for her. I love the, the last line in her piece. I wish I could just find it here, but it said it was, Hang on. Here we go. I'm going to find this. 
Um, okay, wait, give me one second. Um, even though the country hasn't been kind, the Pulse nightclub massacre, on, it carried me. Um, let me see, the darkness came calling, urging me to retreat in fear, to hide myself in the shadows. But the love, here's the line, but the love and support from family, friends, and country pulled me back from the darkness that day. I felt the weight of my profound grief spread across millions of shoulders. Yeah, I, I was happy to get that story. Where mm. Our books are very timely. We actually get in trouble with the, with the industry because they say your books, you put them out too close to the publication date and we don't have time to write reviews of them. But and they can be. Yeah, that's what makes them so relevant. I mean, a lot, it's amazing to me when I see books, I get advanced reader copies of books that aren't coming out until 2018 and I'm reading them in, you know, August of 2017. I mean, we're just sending to the printer today our Step Outside Your Comfort Zone book that comes out in October. We're like, we're really just in time publishing, but it allows us to be very relevant as a result. On the pulse. You know, I know when we were doing um, Chicken Soup for the Soul, Dreams and Premonitions, um, I, uh, shame on me, but one of, one of the stories came in and it was from a friend of mine who's gay. And she was like, should I change um, what I'm like, should I make it a man instead of a woman that I, and I was like, it's such a good story. Maybe you should. Cause I didn't know you well enough. I didn't know that this brand would celebrate the diversity. And then I asked you, I was like, Oh, Amy, well, I just need to go here. And you were like, almost like you spanked me <laughs> through the phone. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? Who do you I'm think like we are? Of course. We celebrate diversity. We, it's not just about feel-good stories, transformation among, uh, among a very minority of like white Christian people. <laughs> it's like, no. No, not at all. We're not even, we're not a religious company. We're not a Christian publisher. We have, you know, people of Lots. religions who love our books because we are all about great values and being kind to each other. And every religion um, has a list of those values. They're not just Christian values. They're all religions have those values. Well, but, if we were connected to the... from somebody who, yes. um, yeah, I'll get a story from somebody who will keep saying my partner or this met they'll never say, and I'll go Google that person. And then I'll, I'll write an email to that person and say like, Hey, Mary, can you just say that your partner's name is Susan? You know, like go for it. Like, why are you trying to hide it? So, yes, we are, of course, we include everybody in our books, and we do not tolerate any intolerance whatsoever at Chicken Soup for the Soul. Mm, being intolerant of the intolerance. That's the only thing we do That's a tolerate. tweetable. The only that thing we is don't tolerate is intolerance. <laughs> That's a tweetable. Boom. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, there's something about... Um, and, and being inclusive means celebrating both sides of the aisle. And yet I know um, the, the story that I wrote for this book, and I didn't know you were going to, that you were even writing this book and that you were going to like my story, but it was inspired by the, by the Women's March. And um, I got some flack for it, <laughs> but it's interesting how adverse times can make us more bold and it, it inspired me to, because I am not typically a political person at all. I have shied far away from it because I didn't want to ever offend anybody. I wanted to be Switzerland in my world and have everyone feel safe with me. And all of a sudden, it's, it hasn't been that way. It, things have changed. And um, so has, have, you've become more bold as well. So <laughs> how do you... If, if standing for what we have always stood for is now considered political, but I actually, right. I don't really see it as an issue. I can't imagine we would lose any of our readers because we embrace a policy of inclusion in our stories. The, right. It doesn't matter who people voted for. I just can't imagine that any of our readers are not in favor of celebrating our differences, being kind to everybody, looking out for each other. We're all in America together. 
Right. I don't think that we have readers who would disagree with that. One of the things that I've learned from these books is that they have introduced me to other people. And I think that's what we do in our books. We introduce people to each other. We have, mm. we have 101 stories in this book. I am sure that a lot of these people voted for Trump and a lot of these people voted for Clinton and a lot of these people voted for Johnson and a lot of these people voted for the other candidates. And they're all meeting each other in this book. Right. We get to meet all these people. We get to meet a Muslim talking about his life. We get to meet, you know, an evangelical Christian talking about her life. We meet all of these different people, straight and gay, black and white, immigrants have been here for, for centuries. And we all get together in these books and we meet each other. And I personally have gotten to know people much better as a, as a result of reading all these chicken soup for the soul stories, because I don't meet these people every day where I live. I only meet other people who live in the New York area. Right. Right. I think the story that you lead with is pretty extraordinary about the, the Jewish synagogue that um, burned down and they needed a place to, to put their congregants or their, to have their, their satyrs, to have their, to, to worship. And, and all the other synagogues were like, well, I'm sorry, our spaces are always filled on those same days too. So there's, we can't really help you. And the only place that, they could find was the the only place that was open to letting them borrow their space was the was the Mormon temple. Exactly, and then they used the, the they used the Mormon temple space for more than a year, and then when they were moving everything back into the synagogue after they repaired it from the fire, they found all these old boxes of records that had survived the fire, and in one of the boxes they found a folder from. <laughs> many decades earlier and it was a thank you letter from that same mormon synagogue mormon temple thanking them for letting the mormons use the jewish temple during the time that the mormons were constructing their temple and so it turned out they had just reciprocated but they didn't even know that and then when they actually brought everything back into the newly built synagogue the mormons and the jews together carried um, the Torah scrolls and all of the other special things, the mile and a half from the Mormon facility to the rebuilt Jewish facility. And, they and you couldn't tell who was who. You didn't know who was who. And they were just passing things down this line because that's what we are about. That's America is about embracing all religions and living together in peace because does it really matter what religion? The melting pot. You know, I want to, I want to acknowledge that um, I know that you've recently um, created a, an alliance and a partnership with A plus and completely um, without any prompting from you whatsoever. Dana came in here a couple of days ago, Dana, my husband and said, look at one of his friends sent him saying, this is the kind of videos that we need to make. And it was a video of, I believe it was the actress who was in seven years a slave. I, I don't know the name of the actress, but it was at the essence awards. And she was talking about, she's very dark skinned. And she was talking about how she considered that to be ugly and how she always wished that she had pale skin and that that would be so beautiful. And until there was a model that, that, that became a supermodel that was ebony. And she thought, wow, if this is considered beautiful, then what if I'm beautiful? And Oprah Winfrey considered her to be beautiful and, and just redefining beauty. And it's no matter who you are, you've got some idea of what beauty is, whether it be skin color or body type or age or whatever. And watching this video makes you just feel beautiful. It makes you want to melt away. And then at the end, it said, A plus, chicken soup for the soul. I was like, oh, that's chicken true. soup. You know how we got no, we met A plus because we admired their videos and and so we said we have to get to know this company and it turned out they're in New York City, we're in southern Connecticut, and we met A plus and it turned out that they were looking for the kind of partnership that we represented. And so we bought uh, about three quarters of A plus and the other quarter of A plus is owned by Ashton Kutcher and we work closely with <laughs> A plus is all Hi, about Ashton. What you stand for. It's all about positive journalism. It's amazing. Uh, positive stories and 
And it's also a great way of, of getting the message to the millennials who all grew up with our books. You know, they all grew up with Chicken Soup for the Preteen Soul and Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul. And so now we are engaging with them through A plus as well. And good for Ashton Kutcher. I know that he was known for so many things, being an actor and pretty boy and punked and being being associated with this and creating positive media. It's just bravo, bravo. I was telling one of the contributors to this book about A plus and Ashton Kutcher. And she was like, so now because I'm in this book, I'm like, a half of a degree of separation from Ashton Kutcher. That's so cool. That just makes it even cooler. It's to me, I think it's, it's great when you can make kindness cool. It used to be cynicism is cool. If you have that dour, sour look, then that, then you're cool. Then you're pensive. Then you've got it going on. But nope, I think that's old school. New school is definitely the being kind. Um, so I gave hats to all the A plus employees and all the chicken ah. employees for Christmas. Here's here's our hats. <laughs> ah. That's Make America kind again. And these are the hats that we made in November of 2016. Amy, yeah. I want one. I need one. I, I have to find one. Them on our website. I have to get one for Dana and myself. <laughs> instead of POTUS, I'm going to get that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want that hat. Um, this is not a story in the book, but here, this is an example of the things that you think of when you read this book, the, the memories of happy, kind, shocking things come to you. So I was reading this book and, so, and a memory came to me of a really kind thing that I should, if you're going to do a part two of this book, I'm going to submit this, this little story. Can I tell you? I just, I'll make it Absolutely. really short. Get me started on my next one. You know, this actually was book two because... We did a book that came out in February of 2017 called Random Acts of Kindness. Uh -huh. And that book, we keep running out of it. We keep doing emergency reprints. It's crazy. We've already printed over 100,000 copies. And oh. it just keeps selling and selling and selling. And we said, well, obviously, kindness is cool, as you've just said. And that's why we decided. That's to a hashtag. Yeah, My Kind of America. And so I could easily see us doing a third book about kindness. Amen. Third time's a charm. So let's hear your uh, story. So it was around Christmas, um, probably 10 years ago, and I was off my gourd. I was, I was dealing with traffic. I was trying to rush. I had people coming over. I had tons of shopping to do. And I had completely lost the plot of the whole Christmas season. I was just rushing, rushing, rushing. And the lines at the bank, the lines at church, the lines everywhere, I was just like, ugh. And I was driving, I was turning left, I was driving a big SUV, turning left out of a parking space, and I didn't even look to my right. There was this little teeny car that I completely bumped into. I hit this car, and I, I jumped out of my car, obviously put it in park first, jumped out of my car and I was just like, I am so sorry. Oh my God, are you okay? This little teeny old lady comes out of the car and I was just so ashamed of myself. She walks up to me with her arms outstretched and just gives me the biggest hug and says, oh, sweetie, it's going to be okay. Just slow down. You're uh -huh. right where you're supposed to be. And I am sobbing in her arms, just saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so, and, and she had not a dent on her car. She was totally fine. Oh, it, that's it, great. it felt like it was angelic. Like this was a little angel that totally woke me up out of my blurry, flurry, flurry, whatever that was to like get me back in my spirit and back connected. And so I could proceed about the Christmas season more lucid, even if I was late, even if I didn't have everything I needed. And well, it here's was... the thing, we're collecting stories for a new Christmas book for 20. Oh. <laughs> so how about if you write the story for our Christmas book? Because people always need help, you know, finding that Christmas spirit again each season because they're so stressed. They're the busiest they ever are going into Christmas. So yeah. Like yours are wonderful reminders to slow down, not a big deal. 
a car is just a car, right? Even right. But could you, car. have you, could you ever, I mean, every time you hit, I mean, if there's ever an accident, the person jumps out and they yell, it's just kind of the protocol, <laughs> but no, this woman taught me. And there was, there was a time not too long after that somebody hit me and I jumped out of my car and I hugged that person because I remembered that little old lady instead of being mad mm -hmm. and angry and, oh, you hurt my neck. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm, it's okay. It's okay. So paying that one forward. Anyway, these are the kind of things. I mean, I, I dare anybody to read this book without tissues because thinking that you're not going to cry. No, you will cry. Take off all your mascara, take out your contact lenses, <laughs> let yourself feel it because it's cathartic. It's, it's good. It's like embryonic fluid. We need it. It helps to remind us that America is a kind place and we do live in a really great world. My, my dear friend, Joe Gagnon, he just did a, a marathon. He did six marathons around the world in, in a row. And one of the reasons he did this was because he travels the world constantly was to tell people um, the world is a beautiful place filled with beautiful people. There's nothing to be afraid of. Don't be scared to travel. Open your heart, embrace new people. And, and it's true. It, this, this is absolutely true. So Amy, thank you so much for putting this collection together, My Kind of America, and for hashtag make America kind again. <laughs> My Kind of America. I love it. Thank you so much. And thank you for all that you stand for and your personal tolerance and for having done the difficult work to um, usher this turtle coming down the, the slide and, and caring for it so well. I'm the Hurricane Harvey turtle, I think. So yeah. yeah. And oh, we're doing a, um, a Twitter chat. We're launching the book on Twitter. Today. today. Yes. At Eastern time. The hashtag is my kind America and uh, our writers of the individual stories will be on Twitter talking. I'll about be on it. Yeah. I'll be talking about my story. There's no place like Ohm. So people can go to, they can just go to Twitter and then put in the search bar, my kind America, all one exactly. word. And, and that, that will, will help get them, them into our Twitter chat. And then everything they post, you have to make sure you put hashtag my kind America on every post so that everyone else gets to see it. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you again so much, Amy Newmark. Thank you for publishing this book. And also looking forward to talking to you about this as a little preview of coming attraction. All right. So thank you everybody for watching and or listening. Don't take your dreams lying down. And remember America and this world is a big, beautiful place and you are a very important part of it. Don't forget that. Okay, sweet dreams until we meet again.